Hello, everyone, and welcome back to La Cancha. We just had Super Sunday in La Liga with games involving a lot of top teams. I believe three out of the top nine play today. Barca versus Atletico, obviously, was the big one. We had Rayo versus Betis. We had our also Ciudad Real Maria. And then Saturday, we had Villarreal versus Real Madrid and all very high-profile games in Spanish football. And we're going to start right at the top with Barcelona because they've gone to the top of the table after beating Atletico at the Wanda Metropolitano. And the caption is says here is Barca escapes from the Metropolitano with three golden points. You agree with that, Oscar? Uh, yeah, it's fair to say we you know, had a lucky break or two in that game, especially at the end. But three points that keep us clear of Real Madrid, I, it makes me like not really care about the performance that much. Yeah, and, and, and let's go into the game because in this game, I felt if we're looking at it from, I'll give the athletic point of view, you can give Bars point of view, but mm -hmm. from an athletic point of view, I felt they entered the game so poorly. The mistakes they made at the back and Barcelona just capitalized on that. And you look at, and it led up to the first goal by Pedri where Pedri just had the freedom of Atleti's midfield. I'm sorry, first goal by Dembele where Pedri had the freedom of Atleti's midfield. Renildo wasn't strong enough in that challenge from Gavi and it just leads to Dembele having a sweet one-on-one -on -one, and that's how the game started. And it was like, Pretty much, I thought Barcelona dominated, but they dominated more because of the fact that Atleti didn't show up for that first half, and they were quite poor. Yeah, I, that's a fair comment. Like, like you said, for the goal, Pedri had actually had the option of looking left and right before deciding, I'm going to run through the space that these four Atleti players are giving me, and... Yeah, it was pretty poor from them all for Atleti all round, but and it took on to almost going down two 0 to get a reaction. Yeah, and this was against a Barcelona side that has suffered a lot of criticism this week, and um, they were without Robert Lewandowski. We spoke about what happened in the game against Espanyol, but now in midweek against Intercity, Barcelona <laughs> they had a scare and going yeah. out to one of the worst teams and. I believe they, they're, I'm not sure whether they're even in Primera Ref, but they might be in Segunda Ref. They're, they're in Primera, Primera they, Ref. We, yeah. Barca B played against them yeah. this season. <laughs> yeah, and, and I remember looking at their, like, in the relegation zone there, and it's just really surprising that Barca had to <laughs> really fight to get through against one of those teams. Honestly, this team has almost killed me twice this week. <laughs> but thankfully, we survived. Yeah. And I'll say it was a really good defensive performance from um, from Barca's backline. Kunde had a good day. Uh, Araujo had, had a very good game as well. He really needs a job, Felix. And Christensen, he was very good. He was very cynical in some of his tackles. But <laughs> hey, like if you're winning 1-0, it's a tough game. And you have to do those kind of tackles. Yeah, I thought... And yeah, Rahul will rightly get the plaudits for that goal in terms of I thought Chris Tansen was the best of all the defenders in terms of his game. You know, and it's just that these three players you mentioned, all of them are missing during the other big part of the season, the entire Madrid game. So it kind of yeah. it's kind of sad that like teams could have been, may have been very different if one of them was there, but you know, that the past is the past, but the present is there. Really, it's been they were really good defensively. Ter Stegen, besides flopping at a few corners, was good, and yeah. the rest of the team, even though in attack and keeping possession, they were quite average. They, I thought that everyone you know did their bit to just ensure that we get the three points in a defensive way. Yeah, and that's something that's surprising for Barca because like normally if they're under pressure, like the way Atleti put them under pressure for. The remaining part of the game after the goal because i feel this game can be split into two parts the first 25 minutes where barca were all over atleti atleti were making mistakes they were almost gifting goals to barcelona mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they were a bit lucky in some calls and after the goal it's almost as if atleti woke up and barca were really under siege and they were creating chances especially in that first half 
there were a couple of corners where I felt could have gone in cross and it was just it was just wild that Barcelona were able to hold on. Yeah, it's a new side of us this season. You know, there have been there have been games where we've blown the points away, and there have been games where we've ground out a few one nils this season. You know, keeping like keeping all these clean sheets is also very important because we've only considered six, and by this time last year we considered twenty one. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, we have the defense to thank for. You know. Being defenders for once, not like in the past years where we were giving away penalties steadily and stuff. Yeah, and how big is this for the title race from a Barca perspective? Yeah, I think it's pretty big, but it's far from over. Like, yeah, as let's say hypothetical scenario, we're still three points ahead of Roma during the next classical, and then we lose. Yeah, we'll be but... behind them on head to head, so it's not over. Yeah, and as we've seen from Real Madrid this week, it's still a long way to go. And both teams that could, like, they're doing very well, but, like, there's still a possibility that they will drop points before El Clasico. So we might look at a different table mm-hmm. once we get there. And um, I to speak, to go back to the athletes, this athletic performance, I felt, I felt this was possibly their best performance of the season since the game against Corbuga and the Metropolitano where... It was 0-0, and I felt they weren't that bad against Real Madrid. They deserved more from this game. They deserved more in that game against Madrid and against Bruga. But we're seeing a team that they just can't get it over the edge when they're dominating. They just can't be forceful, be clinical. It seems like they're lacking that sense of forward, that guy who can finish up chances or goals from around the team. Yeah, there have been... A few games this season where Atleti have had a lot of shots, but just one goal or sometimes no goal. Like, for example, against Espanyol, 10 men Espanyol, by the way, at home, they had 27 shots, just the one goal. Against, who was it? I think it was another home game where, yeah, against Rayo, that they had a lot of shots too and nothing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, the defense, a lot of some of the defending by Atleti this season has been horrible, but then the lack of cutting their job front is also exacerbating their problems. Yeah, and I just feel they're not, the, the way they enter this game, they, they were just not aggressive enough. And mm-hmm. it's not like the players don't have it in them because, as we saw, as, as the game went on, they became more aggressive, they became on more on the front foot. But you're right about their home record in that they have the 13th best home record in La Liga so far. They've let 13 points escape from the Wanda Metropolitano this season. And that's something that if you are a club that's to aspire for greater things than just top four, you have to improve. Your home record has to be your bread and butter. Exactly. And yeah. if we compare the home record to the rest of the teams around them, you have better their third, with L'Oreal are fifth, Athletic are fourth. Yeah. So, yeah, it's some it's an area where they really need to improve. Yeah, they definitely really need to improve. And let's talk about John Felix, because I thought it was a terrible <laughs> game. I thought it was horrible in this. In this. And if, if you're a player who's, you made a big, you made big noise about how you don't like the team you're playing with, you believe you, you deserve to play for a better team. This is the kind of scenario where you have to showcase why teams should go for you. Because if you're Manchester United or Arsenal and you, you're just looking at this performance, which is on public TV in the UK, and you're like, is this the player I should be paying a £9 million loan fee and a £70.5 million um, transfer fee for? Yeah, that's the thing with Felix. He just, in his athletic career, he barely shows up in huge matches. Yeah. Before That's this game, and this is not me being reactionary, by the way. It's yeah. he's never scored against Barcelona or Madrid. No, in, in games against Sevilla, Real Sociedad, and Betis. Okay, Betis he shows up for, but yeah. <laughs> most of the other ones, Villarreal, not really. Yeah, and yeah. this is a striker that's coming off a run of four games, four goals in three league games against Espanyol. Um, Cadiz and Elche, so that kind of tells you the story. 
Yeah, and, and we're Espanol, Cadiz, and Elche, like Espanol and Cadiz are in the relegation zone. Elche in the relegation zone as well. So, Elche are in the relegation zone, right? Now. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that that tells you a lot of, of all you need to know about this player. And, and I have the, the stats to prove it to you that you're actually spot on here and what you're doing in your analysis because Betis, Villarreal, Sevilla, Real Sociedad, and Madrid, they've been the top six teams that he can play at Atleti mm-hmm. since he's moved to La Liga. They've been the best performance. And he's only scored six goals in 32 games in against those big clubs. And most of them have been against Betis, if I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, half of them are against Betis, two against mm-hmm. Villarreal, one against Sevilla, zero against Barca, Real Sociedad, Madrid. If you pop up Atleti Bilbao as well, which is... I like, think one in the uh, Super Cup. Uh, yeah, in the Super Cup. But in, in the league, like, zero against them. Mm-hmm. That's it. Just shows you that in these kind of games, and this is my frustration with him because against lower level teams, he performs, and I'm not going to take that away from him. But when the games get tough, he hides from games. He's missing. He does things I shouldn't do, and that's why I feel maybe even for from for Atleti for him, they have to get this done this winter because I don't see the situation improving. Well, the thing is, uh, I wouldn't say he really, it's not that he went missing today that was the problem. I feel like his attitude, like anytime he lost the ball or Barca like got, forced a turnover from him, you didn't see any effort to try and win the ball back or anything. It was just pretty, yeah. like the work rate is not there and Simeone, you know, like, Work if there's one thing he wants from his players is a high attacking and defensive work rate, and yeah. you know it's just not there either way. Yeah, it's not just there, and, and then contrast it with a player like Marcus Llorente, who's not as had his greatest time in the last two years, but I thought he was Atleti's best player and how he was all over the pitch. Mm-hmm. His work rate was phenomenal. Yeah, I thought Llorente was Llorente is an example of what it should be not. Not even into Griezmann, because yeah. Griezmann didn't have his best game, but he all he tried to win fifty fifties and stuff. So yeah, at least he was there. Like he had chances. Like mm-hmm. he was there. Like he 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 fought. But yeah, like we can leave Atleti behind him because Barca are now top of the table. They're fourteen points out of Atleti, but I, I guess more importantly for Barca, they are three points out of Real Madrid, who. Found a way to lose against Villarreal, but I, I feel I feel Villarreal played much better than them in that game. I thought they were they were very superior in the first half. They controlled more of the ball. They didn't allow Madrid to exploit them too much on the counter attack. And when Madrid did exploit the counter attack, boy, Raúl Abiol and and um, <laughs> and Pepe Reina, <laughs> his name escaped me, rolled back the years. Yeah, it was a really dominant performance from Villarreal. And if not for some unselfish play, they could have had more than two. And they should have had more than two. Even before the penalty that Real Madrid got, it should have been at least a clear daylight difference between the two teams because Villarreal were really spot on in how they set up, you know, dominating and keeping making sure that Modric, Cruz, and Tramini didn't have any of the ball to do damage to them with, because that midfield tree, plus Valverde, is very good at keeping the ball too. And like you said, Real Madrid, they're a team that even if they don't have the ball, they're very dangerous without it because they can counter-attack. But then Real be made some really good interceptions and avoided that. And yeah, it's the result Villarreal deserve in the end. Yeah, and it's more power to um, Kike Setien because he's been fairly criticized since he came into the job. People were wondering whether he was the right person for it, given what happened at Barca. But I think he's proved again that he's still a very good manager. And we almost forget because of the Bayern Munich game and how Barca ended that league season. But there's a reason why Barcelona wanted to get him as a manager because he was so good. And I feel this may be like with Villarreal, this may be like his level where it's a team that's fighting against a Champions League or Europa League level team. And in general, he does really well against Real Madrid, either whether it's been at Las Palmas or Betis. Like at Betis, I believe he won there for the first time since like 
99 when it was the coach of Betis. Then he kept on winning at the Bernabeu, like not losing at the Bernabeu at Las Palmas. He had a season where Las Palmas didn't lose to Real Madrid and they went on to win La Liga and the Champions League. So I would say this is something that he really needed to maybe reestablish himself and his reputation. Yeah, he really needed it because before the international break, we remember how the fans were like kicking out after two losses in four games, I believe. Yeah. I think one of those defeats was in the Europa League when they were the in conference league, my bad, and when they were the top their group and everything. And yeah, it's been it's been a good opportunity for him to get his message across to the team because this was a team under Emery who are more cautious, more defensive. But now you could see the patterns of a Kiki Setien team, you know, the four three three and everything and yeah, it, of all the teams that needed that break, they needed it most probably as not as much as Sevilla, but they were up there and it's really paying off so far with six wins in a row. Yeah, what I like about this team compared to like his Barcelona team is the forward movements are breathtaking. The way the midfield is broken into Real Madrid and they were creating chances. I really like that about about them. And I think that's something that Villarreal really needed and that they really needed a change of style, a change to be more like going from less pragmatic to be more offensive. I remember I was speaking about this game last week off air and you were talking about how like if Emery was there, it would definitely be like they could get a point from them. And I and I retorted and I was like, you know what, with Setien I feel they have a better chance of winning just based on the style and it proved right on Saturday. Yeah, you were right. You know, like having the quality because Villarreal are a very top quality team and they they had the players to hurt Real Madrid and they were able to do that with this attacking style. Because the thing with Real, Ma- Real Madrid is that I think with Real Madrid and Barcelona is that if you're too scared of them, you're playing to their hands and you have to be brave against them, especially if you have enough quality to do so. Yeah, and, and that, that also leads us to the game we just saw with Atleti and we saw that when Atleti played Barca face-to-face, which is a risky strategy, by the way. They were successful. They were. They looked more likely to win. And same thing, we saw that with Villarreal against Madrid. We saw that with Rayo when they played Madrid. When they played Madrid face to face, they were able to get the win. And I hope more teams look at that and play that way instead of being as cautious. And I just want to give more a shout out to Samu Chukwese, who was really good in this game. I feel. He's been one of the beneficiaries since Setien came in because it looks like Emery didn't really trust him after a while. But with Kike Setien, it feels like he's really thriving under that style of football. Yeah, we spoke about it last week about how both he and Pino are getting more goal contributions and more um, offensive actions because instead of babysitting their fullback, they're now high enough up the pitch to support Gerard when Villarreal have the ball back. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And let's go in, go into the game, like, um, sink our teeth into it. Like, the first goal, like, as I said, Villarreal, they were already creating chances. It was not a surprise that he got it. And then the game got interesting um, with the penalties, <laughs> the tail of two handballs. And at first when I saw the first one, I felt, I felt, I, I was upset. I was upset because I was like, this is another week in a row where a team does really well against Real Madrid and mm-hmm. they get a very unlucky call. And in my head, I was thinking, okay, the ref is not going to give this call the other way around. But Fred Playton, he did give the call when, when he happened to Alaba. Yeah. I feel, honestly, neither of those are penalties. So at least it's good to see that the ref was consistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I agree with that as well. But from a Real Madrid perspective, this is a tough blow to take because you seem like both Real Madrid and Barcelona, they had these tough games going into the weekend that was built up. And Real Madrid, they failed in their test and Barcelona passed with blind calling. Yeah, it's a huge blow because, like you said, Barcelona arguably, in some people's eyes, will have had the tougher task, but 
they did what they had to do, Real Madrid didn't, and the gap, having narrowed it last week, is starting to increase again, but I'm sure that gap will go either way between now and the end of the season. Yeah. But yeah, it's a tough blow to take, considering that even before the break, their league form has been stuttering a little. Yeah, it has, it has been stuttering, and it's, it's interesting that they haven't fully pulled away from the team like Ralph Sociedad, who's just six points behind them, and we'll get on to uh, Philan Mendy. He's been heavily criticized. Real Madrid, they, they need to say they want Alfonso Davis. Do you feel the left back spot is a big issue for them? I don't think it's that big an issue because they have like four players that can play there. Because Alaba could play there, but I don't know with Alaba. When Alaba plays centre back, Nacho plays left back. So I'm like, maybe Ancelotti knows something that prevents him from playing Alaba as a left back more often. Yeah. And you also have, like I've mentioned, Nacho can play there. He's also, funny enough, played Rudiger and, um, what's his name? Vallejo there. The latest one being the <laughs> cup tie against Casarenio. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know. And but Mendy. Camavinga played there in the World Cup, famously. Sure. That's honestly an option they should consider if they're chasing a knock a game or something. Yeah. May I say something about Mendy? Yeah, I was like, yeah, his performance wasn't good, and I was, I was, it was interesting because after the game, I like found out that he's actually wanted by both Man City and PSG. So I'm like, is that <laughs> is this the kind of game that will make Real Madrid think they could cash in? Yeah, since they want Davis. Yeah, because I, I think Mendy has always been as a left back. He's been a phenomenal left back, but in terms of defensively, but going forward, that's where he's been lacking. So I, that's the thing with him. I wonder like whether Real Madrid wants a more flamboyant left back. Maybe they, they can go for Davis or they can go for Miguel at Girona or Fran at Rio. So there are, there are a bunch of options for them that they could that they could settle on. And it would be interesting if they go for Fran or Miguel because it brings up a question that we saw in this game where Real Madrid, for the first time, I believe, in their 121 years, didn't start a Spanish player. Is that a referendum on Real Madrid or a referendum on Spanish, the quality of Spanish um, youngsters going forward? I think it's just on Real Madrid because every other team has at least one or two good Spaniards in there. So, like, like Man City have more Spaniards than them. So I feel Real Madrid, right, have had the opportunity to give the likes of Miguel Arribas, um, I forget his name, Blanco, you know, some oh, Fran, some opportunities. Maybe Fran less so, because he never really started any game when yeah. he was at Real Madrid. They just blown him out immediately. But why so stands is like they could switch from the galactic approach once in a while and just find any gem in their academy, because yeah. Miguel and Fran have high enough ceilings that I think they'll be top left backs. So. Yeah, and even there's Hakimi, who was, although he plays for Morocco, he was a born Spaniard. So there's even an argument that he could have played as a right back for Real Madrid. Hakimi even yeah. used to play as a left back in his first season for Dortmund. Yeah. So, yeah. But let's move on from Real Madrid. Let's go to Real Sociedad, who are just six points behind them. And Real Sociedad, the one thing I liked about this win is because when I was watching the game, it felt like this was they were falling into their old patterns where they played against a team that was super solid defensively and they were just not going to find a way. But in the second half, David Silva really rolled back the years with stunning performance and Alexander Sorloff kept on scoring. And this is without Bryce Mendes, who's been their best player. Yeah, it's an important win for them to you know keep of the, keep setting the pace for the teams behind the top two. And like you said, we also have to give that Silva a happy birthday, which was, today was his 37th birthday, and he marked that with that great goal that was provided by Takekubo, who is also having an excellent season. Yeah. I also thought that E.R. Mendy was pretty good in replacing Bryce. He was, it's like, it makes you feel bad that 
he has been robbed on this opportunity to play more regularly, but at least he's getting that now. Yeah, you almost forget how good he was when he was just breaking through, but to see him do this well, and it's it seems like for Imanol, the, last season, like I was somewhat critical of them because I felt they were just too um, pedantic. They were like a bit boring in the way they played, but this season, it feels like that style of play that I was trying to implement, it's finally starting to work. It's starting to find to bear fruit. Yeah, I feel like the change of system to like a more cent- a more centralized build up is helping them because the tra- kind of football he's trying to play requires a lot of ball to feed players that, that also have that ability to run in behind. And in Kubu, it seems like he's found the perfect guy to really implement this. Yeah, he really has. And with Rasa Stad, how do you rate them compared to Athletic, who they're going to play tomorrow, Monday, and Betis and Atletico? Like, where do you, where would you rank them in terms of which one finishes where? I say with Rio Sosa, that is said that it's kind of the same to my have for another team we're going to mention later. But their ceiling, we don't know their true ceiling yet because their best attacker in our football is just getting back. So if you add him to this, um, their ceiling is really high. So, we, yeah, I think... Sadiq, who has been out Sa- I mean, Sadiq isn't going to play anymore yeah. this season, right? So, yeah. unfortunately. But Sarlot is doing the job right now. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel all these things combined, if Sarlot in particular can keep scoring goals and with Bryce's obviously goal contribution or a football when he comes in, I think they'll have enough to do something good this season. Will it be top four in La Liga? Will it be the Europa League? Uh, will it be a cup? They're still in the cup. I mean, it could be either one of the three. I just... The only issue I have with them is maybe depth. Yeah. In, if they go deep in all three competitions, but then they have some really promising youngsters. You have Navarro, who's been really good in the cup games, and um, there's one that came on today. I, I think Pablo Marin, who I yeah. was really impressed with his cameo. So if they keep, you know, producing young talents to mix with the already talented squad they have, then for sure they can get top four and go deep in the cups yeah my, my one issue with their squad is that the wing backs are quite mid <laughs> that's silly. i feel mm-hmm. apart from that yeah, yeah besides girls uh, well the le- i'll say the left backs are the issue the right backs are okay but yeah rico is having a much better season than last time i has been good when called upon so like I think they'll be okay to finish. I, they can definitely challenge for top four better than they ever have so far. Yeah. Under Emmanuel. Yeah, but Betis will, will give them a strong challenge, right? Luis Enrique came of age today with a wonderful goal. They played against Ryan Cano and it was a fairly interesting game, like very high octane, two fairly attacking teams. And what do you make of Betis in their race to finish in? That top four. I think as long as Betis keep eleven men on the pitch, they have a very good chance. <laughs> yeah. The thing is that Betis this season, they, in terms of goals, they've kind of underwhelmed. Yeah. Because they've been involved in a lot of nil-nil draws, and a lot of draws in general because of said red cards. But today, we were really good. They hit the bar a couple of times after they scored the second goal. You know, Luis Enrique had a great game. Like, recently, he's just been killing all the left-backs he's facing, which is why mm-hmm. I'm kind of worrying for Jordi Alba or Baldi or Alonso, whoever faces him in the Super Cup, because this guy is a man on a mission, and it's great to see him finally get his first league goal. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And seeing him after what happened last week with his dad and playing here, like pain out of skin, um, I was really happy for him. And I'm yeah. really happy for Betis because like, it seems like they're on the right path again. And I looked at the stats and it feels like they haven't really regressed so much from last season in terms of points. And you mentioned with the red card record and if they 
are able to keep their discipline record hot better, if they're able to get a better discipline record, you might wonder whether they might give like Real Sociedad, Atleti, or run for their money in terms of that Champions League spot. Yeah, definitely. I feel like that top four race is really tight now, especially as Villarreal have come back into it with a good run of form when when they were a bit adrift a couple of matches ago. So yeah, it's going to be really tight. Honestly, I can't really, I can't really hand on hand say who's going to finish third or fourth. Yeah, I think earlier in this season when you asked me this question, I said. I'd like to say Atleti will get at least fourth, but to be honest, I don't know. They're doing a lot of negative things for the first time ever this season. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to I'm not going to say <laughs> anything. But, well, I, well let, let's see. Because Betis, right? Alex Mourinho is apparently linked with the movie, anyway, so if that happens, that's massively going to affect them. Yeah. But yes. he's always linked to the movie. <laughs> Come again? He's always linked to the move away. Yeah, true. Yeah. And also for Villarreal, I was going to mention Pepe Reina before. I'm like, yeah. I don't know if they're going to do about the goalkeeping situation since they've sold Rooney really? to Ajax. And uh, Pepe Reina, I'm not so I'm not so sure honestly. Even even after his game against Real Madrid, he looked. I mean, he still had that great save from Vinicius. Yeah. I mean. Uh, the team with older goalkeepers, right? Their position is very good. Yeah. This is really spot on because of their experience. My issue is with the possible reflex saves you might have to make. True. The yeah. reflexes might not be as sharp anymore. Yeah, that, that is very true. That is very true. And I've seen him in some conference league games. So. <laughs> sure. But uh, on Rayo, Rao de Tomas showed up. Um, any impressions of him in this game? Oh. Yeah, he didn't really impact the game so much. He tried to link with Cameo, who scored the game, by the way, a couple of times. But I, I, it's still early days for him. But the idea that team I was talking about there, that uh, their ceiling might increase because they just dropped this really good striker into their attack. So who knows, might he help Ryo overachieve even more and break into the top six or seven? Yeah, who knows? It's pretty possible. Yeah. Especially as they don't have a cup run to the strike them this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they lost to Sporting Gijon. That, that was a fascinating game. But let, let's go to Mallorca because they, they're they one of those teams where it's like they have a chance because they're six points behind um, Betis at the moment. But, but they really we, have we, a chance. We don't, they don't really have a chance. Uh, they <laughs> we, we spoke about how we didn't really see the best of them against Atafe. I don't think we saw the best of them here, but if you need a late go from Mallorca, you just call on Abdon Prats and he'll, he'll get the goal. Yeah, he had scored the important goal for them to help them stay up last year, and he scored a very important one this time in a, in a possible um, this thing, in a possible late um what? Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. A possible time. relegation battle. <laughs> yeah. Relegation rival and river. Though. So that win keeps them clear. Yeah, it really does keep them clear. And the, the other thing about this game, because like it seemed like not much happened, was the fact that Scaloneta arrived in Spain. Um, Scaloni was a former uh, Mallorca player, so it seemed get on it like this was nice. Yeah, it's nice to see Scaloni get on it. And I hope he stops by Depper so they could do something nice for him too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so l- let's run through the other games because like after the top 10, there's a big gap. There's a, there's a big race for, um, to avoid relegation. And we're going to start with Valencia Cadiz. And Cadiz, they had a really good performance against Valencia. They were able to win. And this puts Valencia in a quite complicated situation because there's a four-point gap between Valencia and Cadiz, and Cadiz are in the relegation zone. Yeah. Valencia, um, they haven't had the best couple of weeks coming back from the break. And after going one nil down against Cadiz, they had no way to really break them down. There wasn't really to make their cup chances. So that would worry me for them. So 
they need the result as soon as possible. Yeah. Well, do. for Cardis, you know, they, this was a result that they really needed and it's, it temporarily put them out of the relegation zone. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, the other big relegation six pointer was uh, Girona versus Espanyol. And we saw here Giangel Herrera coming back to Espanyol, where we played for, I believe, last season, and he silenced the RCD in a quite entertaining Catalan derby. Yeah, it was a really good game, honestly. Like, especially from Girona, like, you can just see, like, watching them is really pleasing on the eye this season. Yeah. Not just young girl, you know, Rodrigo Ricalmi, Alex Garcia are now you know, such a talented team. It's just a shame they can't defend to save their lives. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the one thing you know about them is like you're gonna they're they're gonna score goals, they're gonna concede goals. And a word on Hosselu for Espanyol because he's the second top scorer in La Liga at the moment. Is is what's going to happen to Alaves happen to him again where like he scores most of the goals but he's unable to save Espanyol? Honestly, at this point, you might have to say yes because he's not really getting too much help from the rest of the forwards. Although Poado scored a goal for Espanyol this weekend, you'd hope from an Espanyol perspective that he kicks on and chips in to help us a yeah. But yeah, with that defense, honestly, they're going to need an MSN level season to save them. <laughs> True. Because Espanyol they don't seem to be able to defend set pieces in any way, shape or form well. So, you know, they have to look that their new signing season Montes can fix that. Yeah, they would have to open another team hoping for a better defensive record is Sevilla and Sevilla this season they've been so poor at home. Um they signed Bad Bade from Nottingham Forest, Ren, mixture <laughs> mixture both of them. And they played against Atafe, which is one of their favorite teams to play against. And they won their first home game in La Liga this season. I thought they were really good. And is this the start of something new for Sevilla? And it's too early to say, but <laughs> you know, it's a much needed win. This was their first home win since May, and yet, you know, something that will boost them, and especially as some other teams around them. Lost. I can't believe we're talking about the mere relegation battle for crying out loud. But yeah, yeah. um, River the lead, who I forgot to mention, are on a four game losing streak without any goal, and Almeria just lost. So that would yeah. be a boost for Sevilla, who are playing Girona next. I believe they're also playing Cadiz soon. Soon and Elche as well. So they are going to <laughs> they get to have that relegation, lots of relegation six pointers coming their way. Um, speaking of relegation zone though, we're, let's talk about Elche who are caught adrift. And I really enjoyed Salta Vigo's performance in this. Um, Aspas was like brilliant for them once again, scoring a, a vital goal. But let's talk about Elche because they're set to be one of the worst teams in La Liga to support in Kihan. Yeah, it's really not looking good. I mean, their performance in this game was not so bad. But at this point, that's just scant consolation. Yeah, if we, they have four points so far. They have 11 points away from safety. It's They're starting to look doomed, if we're being honest. Yeah, uh, let's just, yeah, let's just take a quick... Oh, this is the Copa del Rey draw. Um, a lot stands out here where, like, you see a big game is obviously Villarreal Real Madrid, uh, but Barcelona obviously got the luck of the draw. <laughs> Although the Croatia manager was pretty pissed off when Xavi said that. Oh yeah, the lower league opponents comments. Well, I don't know. I feel Xavi complains a bit too much about draws. So let's hope this doesn't bite us in the ass. If I give yeah. my language. <laughs> yeah, I don't hope that. But like, let's get to the La Liga standings and. As you can see here, Barcelona are pretty on top of the table. And just look at that. Between Valencia and Espanyol, five points separates 11 from 19. This could be a relegation battle for the ages. <laughs> yeah, but out of those teams, honestly, well, I think really rather well, they're dropping like a stone, so I think they'll definitely be down there. Sevilla, you'd have to think they're going to improve at some point. Yeah. 
Espanol, Espanol are the weird one because they shouldn't be down there with the quality they have yet. Well, let's see. Yeah, and, and thing thing that worries me from an Espanol fan is that Cadiz have been they've been improving week over week, so that would be something that would really worry me. But yeah, it would, it's going to be an interesting relegation battle. After like a few weeks ago, before the World Cup break, we thought okay, the relegation isn't going to be as interesting, but now it's definitely proved to be. Uh, let's talk about other leagues and um, in the other European leagues, Juventus are second. Really surprising, given how poorly they started the season. They're seven points away from Napoli. Napoli lost them um, to enter to yeah, well, they bounced against... back. Yeah, they, they really bounced back today against Sampdoria. While yeah, back. and I'll ask you about Chelsea because um, as someone who watches it from afar, seeing them as a mid-table team is quite surprising. Yeah, with Chelsea, it's a combination of a lot of teams. You know, they have a pretty bad injury list right now. You could even argue that the injured XI is better than the current one. <laughs> so they've had to use a lot of new faces in the last few games. And also, I, this is just a general problem Chelsea have had since 2004. Not having too many clinical strikers. Mm. Because I can only think of two or three seasons where Chelsea striker scored more than 20 goals in the league. And that was dropped by in 2010. And Diego Costa twice. So that's um, a pro- that like, You could make a whole video on why Chelsea strikers struggle. <laughs> but, yeah. And then, you know, the Potter situation, a new coach coming into all these difficult situations you know it's never it's not ideal for anyone yeah and it could get worse yeah, it really could. i i don't think it's something that you simply spend your way out of i think you just have to weather the storm and yeah. hope that you can recover a few players yeah but the owners seem to think otherwise they've spent i think they've broken a record for spending this this year or this mm-hmm. season given how much they spent on players and they still set to like spend a lot more. They're hoping to get bring in Enzo Fernandez from Benfica, although it seems that that deal has somewhat gone off the boil. And speaking of Portugal, Braga second in the Portuguese league, which I feel is interesting and something that's worthy of discussion, given that it's usually dominated by Benfica and Porto. But if you're looking for a very good title race and you're like, okay, all the top five leagues don't do it for me, check out the Eredivisie title race because. Ajax losing Ten Hag has had ripple effects in that league, and I believe there are about five teams separated by five points or something crazy like that. So that's something to keep on, something to keep an eye out for if you're looking for entertainment beyond the top five leagues. Yeah, our division is really crazy this year. <laughs> just like you said, just the four points separating Feyenoord and AZ. So yeah. that's one to keep an eye on. Like and also with uh, PSV losing Gapo, that might even make things. Yeah, better. true. That 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 will definitely affect them. And I guess Ajax signing Rui will be a big boost for them if they want to win the Eredivisie again. True. Yeah. And with that, guys, uh, we just like to thank you for listening. And uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, please give us a like, uh, comment, or share. And we truly appreciate that. Um, Oscar has to run and take a trip, so. Adios, Oscar. See you next week. See you next week. Yeah, we might have taps for the Super Cup final. And so we can discuss the tournaments and what's going on there as well for next week. So thanks, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. And enjoy your week. Adios.